Autism Quality of Life Podcast, Episode 15. The program really came out of this idea that, you know, there was this gap in not only services that were available to youth with autism, but also an evidence-based intervention. Hey, Quality of Lifers. I'm so excited to share who today's guest is. It's Dr. Elizabeth Loggison, the founder of the PEERS program. So PEERS is an evidence-based social skills program, and I actually discovered it when I was in graduate school, and I was trying to figure out what kinds of services actually existed for adults with autism, teens with autism, and I was conducting a meta-analysis, and I was going through the different research databases and journals, and I actually came across PEERS back in 2013, and I was immediately intrigued. And I actually went out to UCLA in 2014 and became a certified provider of the program. And I'm a huge advocate. It's been really exciting to be able to actually bring this program to Indianapolis and to run some peers groups for teens and their families there. And more recently, Dr. Lagasin has come out with a curriculum for young adults. So a young adults manual for individuals ages 18 to 35 And so I'm really excited to be able to share this interview with you where she talks about her different programs and the work that the Peers team has accomplished over the years. Okay, so let's get into the episode with Dr. Lagasin. I am so thrilled to announce that today I have with me Dr. Elizabeth Lagasin. She is an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA Semmel Institute and is a licensed clinical psychologist. She's also the co-developer of an evidence-based social skills intervention known as PEERS. Since 2010, she has authored four books related to social skills training, including the PEERS manuals for teens, school-based professionals, and young adults. She has trained thousands of mental health professionals, educators, and families in the PEERS method, and is dedicated to developing and testing evidence-based treatments. Dr. Lagasin's peers' manuals have been translated into at least a dozen languages, and the program is used in over 25 countries. Dr. Lagasin has presented at international conferences, and her work has been featured on national and international media outlets, such as People Magazine, USA Today, the LA Times, the New York Times, CBS, and NBC, to name a few. So Dr. Lagasin, I'm so excited to chat with you. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for having me. Please fill in any gaps from that introduction and tell us a bit more about you. Um, Well, I think you did a great job introducing me. Thank you. Um, I guess just to give you a a little background about peers for your listeners who aren't familiar with the program, it's an evidence-based social skills intervention. So there's a lot of research to sort of support the effectiveness of the program. That makes it actually rather unique from other social skills interventions. And it's also unique because it's parent-assisted, meaning that we include parents and other caregivers in the intervention as a way of providing social coaching out in the real world. And then another thing that sort of makes peers rather unique is that we use ecologically valid social skills. And what that means is that we're not teaching what we think that teens and adults should do in social situations, but what we know actually works in reality. Okay. So you mentioned that there's parent involvement in the groups. What is the structure exactly? How are peers groups typically set up? That's right. So peers is a 16-week week weekly intervention. Um, the groups meet for 90 minutes once a week, and there's a concurrent parent and teen or young adult session, meaning that parents, and teens, and young adults meet simultaneously but in different rooms. And again, the reason to include parents and caregivers is to really have them act as social coaches to these teens or young adults out in the real world. And so the skills that we focus on are things like making and keeping friends, having good conversations with people, handling peer conflict and peer rejection. And in our young adult program, we also have sessions on dating etiquette. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's always an interesting couple of sessions. <laughs> People enjoy that one. Yeah, so you mentioned a young adult program. How many programs are there then? At present, we have 
four different programs. So we have two for adolescents. There's our parent-assisted program, which, again, is that weekly 90-minute um, program. Then we also have a school-based intervention where peers is taught in the classroom, uh, much like you would teach math or science. That's also a 16-week curriculum. Then we have our young adult program, which is 16 weeks in length with that caregiver assistance. And then one of our newer programs is Peers for Preschoolers. And that program is for kids that are four to six years of age. These are high-functioning kids with autism. And in that particular program, we focus more on play skills and friendship skills and really coach parents on how to set up their child's social world, getting them enrolled in social groups and play groups, and also how to organize successful play dates with other families. Neat. Well, since the podcast typically tends to draw folks who might have children who are teens or adults or professionals who are working with teens and adults on the spectrum, I thought maybe we can focus on the the adolescent parent intervention and the young adult interventions for today. Does that work for you? That, That sounds great. I'd love to do that. Excellent. So you mentioned how there's a parent component to the groups. What other things might families who may have heard about peers in passing want to know? So maybe age requirements, other things that they should consider when thinking about enrolling in peers? Well, one of the things that we're pretty careful about with this intervention for teens and adults is that we really only include socially motivated young people, um, meaning that they have to want to learn the skills related to making and keeping friends. I'm not sure that um, it's, it's honestly even that ethical to force social skills on an adolescent or young adult who doesn't want to learn them, but it's certain, it certainly wouldn't be effective. So that's one of the first requirements is that the, the teen or young adult actually wants to be in the intervention. Another thing that we want to make sure is that we've got somebody to help support them outside of the treatment setting. Okay. So making sure that there's a parent or a caregiver that's willing to participate in the program on a weekly basis and help this teen or young adult to practice these homework assignments that we have where they're kind of practicing the newly learned skills and and where they're able to provide that additional support um, when the treatment team isn't there. Um, The other thing we kind of assess for is for things like social anxiety. You know, there's a lot of kids with autism that struggle with anxiety. And, you know, I would say that those kids sometimes have a little bit more difficulty participating in a social skills group. Because it is a group treatment, it can sometimes be difficult for them to to be in that group setting. And so in terms of who would be most appropriate for this intervention, I would say someone that can sort of tolerate essentially being um, in a group um, and not experiencing too much social anxiety that would sort of make it detrimental to, to benefiting from the treatment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those are really great points. Yeah. So socially motivated individuals having that social coach present so that they can assist with the weekly lessons and then not having too much anxiety that they can't participate in the group discussions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another consideration would be, you know, autism is a, is a spectrum, as we all know, and there's a lot of variability on that spectrum. And, and Peers was really developed for um, youth that are of average to above average intelligence, meaning that um, they're able to follow along with the lesson, that they have adequate language abilities and, and cognitive abilities, that um, their executive functioning is sort of intact. And so that's another consideration when considering who is most likely to benefit from the treatment is it's a pretty intense intervention with a lot of rules and steps of social skills. And so the program is really designed more for, for the kids that we consider a little bit higher functioning on the spectrum. Okay. So how did you first get the idea for Peers? How was it developed? You know, Peers was developed back in 2004 at UCLA. And at the time, I was just completing a pre-doctoral psychology internship. And um, it was focused on developmental disabilities. So I was working with a lot of kids with autism. And one of the questions that kept coming up was, where can we find a social skills group for our teen? And this was just 2004, um, not that long ago. Um, and, it, you know, UCLA, it's, it's located in a big metropolitan area. And at the time, I had nowhere to refer these families. There were no social skills interventions for adolescents with autism. I think the reason for that is that there's been so much emphasis on early intervention. It's almost like we forgot that those kids grow up. Yeah. Yeah. And that there, you know, the social demands change and the treatment strategies that are are required are going to be different at different stages of development. And so um, I think the, the, the program really came out of this idea that, you know, there was this gap in not only services that were available to youth with autism, but also an evidence based 
interventions. And, and I was starting to specialize in social skills training at the time, and it just was the perfect, perfect timing really to develop this intervention. And so I was very fortunate that I was given um, a postdoctoral fellowship from NIH, the National Institute of Health, um, to, to create um, and develop this intervention and also test the effectiveness of it. And that's really how, how this program all developed, and it's really kind of um, turned into to many different interventions and, and iterations since then. Yeah, that's wonderful. Definitely a huge need in the autism community. And so now you're able to expand the peers' interventions from originally focusing on adolescents and teens and moving into preschool age and also young adults, which is incredible because there really aren't many resources for adults either. Yeah, I mean, you're so right. There is just, there are very, very few really actually services available to adults on the autism spectrum and certainly um, even fewer evidence-based interventions. And so we're really proud of the fact that we've been able to not only develop these programs, but to test the effectiveness of these programs and to also disseminate them and share them with others. Um, that's something that we're really, really passionate about and really excited to be, to be sharing with other people. Yeah, so tell us more about that. How do you test peers using research, and how are you currently disseminating that information? Well, so we've done um, a number of studies on on all of our programs, and and the primary um, method or study design that we use for testing the effectiveness of our programs is called a randomized controlled trial. And in clinical research, randomized controlled trials are really considered to be the gold standard for assessing treatment outcome. And really what that means is you have a group of people and you sort of randomly assign them to either receive treatment A or treatment B, or maybe they're um, receiving treatment immediately versus waiting for treatment. Um, and then you test them um, at pre and post sort of intervention or pre and post waiting period. And that's really the design that we've used. Um, in terms of the kind of outcome measures that we're looking at, um, we look at a combination of standardized measures. So these are measures that have been standardized and normed on a larger group of typically developing people or people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, we do a combination of parent reports, teen or young adult self-reports, and we also do independent reports from teachers and um, other caregivers that are, are what we call blind the conditions under investigation. And what that means technically is that they don't know that the teen or young adult is participating in the program. So they're kind of blind to that. Um, and that makes a very nice independent um, evaluation of social skills. And then finally and more recently, we started to do more behavioral observation um, in our outcome measures where we videotape things like conversations and we code them on different um, scales to look at how those conversational skills improve over time and, and over treatment. You've been doing lots of research on peers and it's considered an evidence-based program. Where might some of our listeners go to maybe read some studies about peers or to find out where you're presenting, things like that? Well, if you go to our website, we have all of our papers um, actually accessible there. I know it's kind of hard for families to sometimes access these peer-reviewed scientific papers, but they're all accessible on our website at UCLA, um, as well as any of the resources. As you mentioned, we have four published books in English, um, one in Japanese and, and one in Korean, and those are all available through our website. Additionally, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Terry, but we also have an app. Um, it's called Friendsmaker, and it's an app that you can just, you know, purchase in the app store. I think it's maybe a dollar or something like that in the app store. Um, and the nice thing about this app is that it sort of acts as a virtual coach for our teens and young adults in the absence of their parents. And so the app is organized where um, we have all of the rules and steps that we teach in our program all organized kind of in an outline form. And there's also embedded role play videos that demonstrate what the skills are supposed to look like or what they're not supposed to look like. And the whole notion behind this app, which is also evidence-based, okay. we've tested the effectiveness of this, this virtual coach. The idea behind it is that it's not always uh, possible or even developmentally appropriate for your parents or your caregiver mm -hmm. to be there when you're interacting with your peers. But most kids have an iPhone or a smartphone. And so that idea of having this app was that they could have that additional support in the absence of a caregiver. So is that available in the iTunes store or where can they find that app? Yeah, that's just in the app store. It's for iOS devices. So iPhones, iPads, iPods. Great. So I believe the Peers for Young Adults manual was recently released. Is that right? 
That's right. It was released um, just a couple of months ago um, after many, many years of, of researching the program. We finally felt comfortable with sharing it with others, and it was a, a great labor of love. We're very excited to be able to be sharing it um, with other people and other practitioners. Is there any content or any stories that you'd like to share with the community about individuals that maybe you've seen really great gains in or certain outcomes that help to highlight how peers works and what it can do for families? Absolutely. You know, I I always love talking about the curriculum, actually, and and to kind of help people to get a a sense of of what we teach. And and there's lots of success stories that I could share with you. Um, And I've written about a lot of them, actually, in the science of making friends. But, you know, what might be even more useful is just to give you a a highlight or an example um, of maybe one of the skills that we teach in peers. And um, one of my favorite skills that I love to talk about um, relates to how to handle teasing. Um, you know, the, the program is really focused on making and keeping friends, but we also teach kids how to handle peer conflict and peer rejection, in, including how to handle bullying. And one of the things that's been really quite, um, you know, sad to see over the years is that kids get a lot of advice when it comes to teasing, but they don't get very good advice. In fact, I would say they get kind of bad advice when it comes to handling teasing and bullying. So when I ask kids what they're told to do in response to teasing, most kids will say that they're told to ignore or walk away or tell an adult. And then I ask them if it works. And what do you think they say? (laughs) Probably not. They say, no, it doesn't work. And they're right. It doesn't work because those skills, those are not ecologically valid skills. Remember how I was saying we like to teach not what we think that kids should do, but what actually works in reality? Well, ignoring walking away and telling an adult do not work in response to teasing. Imagine that someone was teasing me and I ignore them. What are they going to do? Just keep going. They're probably going to, yeah, they're probably going to keep teasing me. Exactly. What if I walk away? What will they do? follow you? They'll follow (laughs) me exactly and probably keep teasing me. And in both of those situations, I look kind of weak because I didn't do anything. I'm probably more likely to be teased. And if I go tell an adult, what do you think that kid's going to want to do when the adult isn't around? Yeah, just retaliate even more. Exactly. They're going to want to retaliate. So those are not ecologically valid social skills. And yet that's what adults tell kids to do across the globe. I do trainings all over the world. And I always ask kids that same question. What do adults tell you to do? And they're always told to ignore, walk away or tell an adult. So instead, what we do is we teach them the ecologically valid skill for handling teasing. So the reality is that every kid gets teased. It doesn't matter how popular you are. Every kid gets teased. It's how you react to it that determines how significantly or severely you're teased. And so kids who are socially successful will do this thing where they'll give a short comeback that shows that what the person said didn't bother them. And actually, what they said was kind of lame. So they'll say things like, whatever or yeah, and, or and your point is, am I supposed to care? Is that supposed to be funny? They'll roll their eyes, they'll shrug their shoulders, and it makes it seem like they're not really bothered. And what the other person said was kind of stupid, which actually embarrasses the person who's teasing them. And that is an example of an ecologically valid social skill. That's the type of social skill that we teach in peers. Again, we're not focusing on what we think that kids should do, Mm -hmm. but we're focusing on what we know socially successful kids do naturally. That's what we want to teach. Okay. Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you. Would you mind sharing a bit more about the young adults curriculum then? So what are maybe some of the new features or additional content that makes it differ from the curriculum that's more for teens? Right. So there's a lot of overlap between the adolescent and the young adult program. I would say probably a good 65%, maybe even 70% of the curriculum in the young adult program comes from the adolescent program. However, there are um, new sessions, four new sessions on dating etiquette that make the young adult program rather unique from the teen program. And so we teach skills like how do you let someone know that you like them? You know, how do you flirt? Um, How do you ask someone on a date? How do you behave on a date? And also just kind of general dating do's and don'ts, as well as things like how do you handle rejection or how do you, you know, politely turn someone down? Um, So those are kind of the skills that we teach. And and they're really fun sessions to teach. I have to be honest. They're just, they're so much fun. (laughs) Um, We do a lot of role play demonstrations in our program. So not only do we have these didactic lessons with concrete rules and steps of social behavior, but we act out 
different social scenarios. We call them role plays and we do good and bad examples of role plays. And then from there, just, you know, by the way, we also have the teens and the young adults practice the skills, of course, in the session. That's called a behavioral rehearsal. And then they practice the skills outside of the group through homework assignments. So in terms of what we might teach in the young adult program um, related to dating etiquette, one of my favorite lessons is on flirting. And this is one of the first lessons we teach related to dating. Yeah. Yeah. And there are actually ecologically valid, you know, steps for flirting. And, and so one of the ways that we teach um, young adults to flirt is flirting with their eyes. So imagine that you're in a public place, you know, there's people around, you see someone across the room, you're sort of interested in them. You're kind of, you know, kind of, you know, curious about them. Maybe Um, you want to show interest. How would you do that? Well, what would be the first thing that you would have to do to kind of show your interest or, or get their attention? What do you imagine you might have to do? Make eye contact. There you go. Exactly. You need to make eye contact. But when you make eye contact, do you want to like stare at them and never look away? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. And do you want to stare at them and just have like a very stoic look on your face? Or do you think maybe you should look friendly and maybe kind of smile a little Mm -hmm. bit? Probably a good idea. Yep. Yeah. So the first step is to make eye contact. You'll definitely want to smile, but smiling, you know, the thing with smiling is you want to give like a slight smile, not like a big, huge, Mm -hmm. toothy smile. Because a big, huge, toothy smile can be a little risky. That could become a little strong. So a little slight smile. I even tell my young adults, no teeth. Yeah, those are great tips. Yeah. And then, of course, we're not going to maintain that eye contact because that could seem a little creepy. So the next step, of course, is to look to look away. Okay, so you've made eye contact, you've given a slight smile, you look away, then what do you do? Are you done? No. You probably want to look back. You probably need to repeat those steps, Mm -hmm. right? So that's the act of flirting, essentially. Making eye contact, give a slight smile, look away, and repeat. Um, And that's just something that we've discovered through research is how people flirt with their eyes. So in terms of how we might teach that to young adults, we would start with a bad role play. And so I'd say, watch this role play and think about what, you know, such and such coach is doing wrong in Mm. flirting with their eyes. And so that's always kind of funny, right? So the real bad role play would be where the coach is kind of looking the other coach up and down and, you know, staring (laughs) and maybe having a big, creepy, you know, huge smile on their face. And we would time out. We say, what did that person do wrong? And they will tell us immediately, well, that was really creepy. He was, you know, staring at this person. He wasn't looking away. He was doing a body scan, looking them up and down. And so we would do some perspective taking from there. We need to work on social cognition for people with autism, get into the mind of the other person. And so we'd ask questions like, well, what do you think that was like for the other person? Or, um, you know, what did, what did they think of that person when they're staring at them like that with this big creepy smile? And would they want to talk to them after that? Um, from there, we show a good example. We kind of go all over all the steps that we just discussed, which are, again, you know, make eye contact, give a slight smile, look away, and then repeat. And then we demonstrate what that's supposed to look like, the good example. And from there, we time out and we say, okay, so what was that like for that person this time? What did they think of this person this time? And would they want to talk to them at this point? And then from there, the next part, which is, is quite entertaining, is that we have the young adults all practice this with one of our social coaches. And so we always have a male and a female coach in the group um, that, that they get to choose to practice with. And it's not really about identifying sort of your sexual orientation. Sometimes people just don't feel comfortable practicing with someone of the opposite sex. Maybe they want a same-sex coach to practice with. But we give them the option, um, and then they practice flirting with their eyes. And then the homework assignment for that week is if they happen to be interested in someone romantically, they might, you know, do use some of the skills that we teach them for letting the other person know that they like them. And one of those skills is, is flirting with your eyes. Oh, that's great. Thanks for breaking that down for us. So that's really interesting to hear the steps for flirting and, and how you really go about teaching that to young adults. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Got to admit, it's a lot of fun. So there's a parent component to the young adults group as well, right? That's right. And, you know, we, it, it doesn't have to be a parent in the young adult program. It's, it could be any caregiver. So it's sometimes an adult sibling. It might be um, another family member. It might be a life coach or a job coach or even a peer mentor. But the idea behind having these social coaches in the intervention is that it not only helps to generalize the skills to other settings, but it actually helps to maintain um, the treatment gains over time. And the idea behind that is that if a parent or a caregiver is involved in treatment, the treatment never ends. 
you know, this is a time limited program. It's 16 weeks in length. We see them for an, you know, an hour and a half every week. That's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things. But when you include parents and other caregivers in the intervention, the program really never ends. And I think that's probably the the true power behind this program is that parent caregiver component. Yeah, that's a really great point. So they can really continue to practice the skills after the 16 weeks ends. And and you're right, it's really just about lifelong learning. So you offer a bunch of trainings at UCLA for professionals. That's right. We have trainings at UCLA probably five or six times a year. Um, We also do certified trainings outside of UCLA. So we probably have a a certified training at least once or twice a month. And there are three-day training seminars. They're they're really focused on um, mental health professionals, educators, people that are working with kids and adults with autism. It's not really geared towards families so much. That's what our program is focused on. And in that three-day training, we um, give a very thorough, very comprehensive overview of the curriculum, both the teen um, as well as the parent sessions. And, and more recently now, we're also expanding to um, a certified training for our young adult program now that that manual has been released. Okay. So we've been very fortunate that we've had many people attend these trainings. And, and as a result, we've got thousands of, of peer certified providers really all over the globe at this point, um, helping families um, help to improve their kids' social skills. It's just very exciting work. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's tremendous. Just the reach that you've been able to really disseminate peers into other countries, other, yeah, that's so exciting. What are some things that are coming up in your world in 2017? So what's something that you're looking forward to? Well, one of the things that we did as a um, sort of a, a companion to the Young Adult Manual recently was we filmed a series of role play videos. There's actually over a hundred role play videos focused on the skills that we teach in our curriculum for both the teen and the um, young adult program. And they're accessible now on a website. Um, This is just a website companion to the young adult manual and anyone can access them for free. And, and that's been really exciting to be able to share that tool with families and with practitioners, with educators. And so what we're working on now is to do something similar with our training videos. So I mentioned to you that we do these three-day peer certified training seminars pretty frequently. And during these training seminars, I'm showing videotapes of um, previous groups where we're sort of running the intervention. And we, we talk about that with the, the attendees. And I have permission to show those videos at these trainings. But what I don't have permission to do is to give those videos to the attendees. And that makes it a little bit challenging for these practitioners to go back and train other people without having videos. And so we were recently given a grant to create a new series of training videos that we can actually share and disseminate um, with others. And so those um, groups have already been filmed, both for our teen and our young adult program. And those will be available, yeah, those will be available later this summer. And I think that's really going to not only assist people that are peer certified providers, but also assist those who are running peers programs that maybe have never attended a peers training seminar. Many, many people um, purchase these manuals um, and they never are able to uh, go to a certified training. And, and that's perfectly fine, but we want to be able to support those individuals and to give them um, really good concrete examples of, of what the intervention is supposed to look like. And so we're really excited about um, releasing those training videos later this summer. So that's something to kind of keep on your radar. Yeah, that'll be great. I would love to post the link on the show notes page as soon as you potentially know what it might be, if that works for you. Yeah, we'll definitely have to keep you posted. Okay. So what advice would you give to families who might be maybe searching for a peers provider in their area or wanting to learn more about peers after hearing about it on this interview? Well, I think that um, there's, you know, as I mentioned, we've, we've trained a lot of people over the years, but there's not always a peer certified provider in every area. So I think probably the first thing to do is, is to check out our website and look under the list of peer certified providers to see if there is someone um, in their area. Um, if not, you know, a good Google search will also let you know if there's someone providing the intervention in the area. They may not be certified, but they might be using the program. And then finally, we also um, wrote a book for families that can't access a peers program 
them. Um, so that's called The Science of Making Friends. It's a parent book, um, but it was not written not just for parents, but also for teens and young adults with social challenges. And I wrote this book not just to focus on, on those with autism, but really anyone that's kind of struggling socially. And so the way that the book works is there's different parent narrative sections that talk about all the different skills that we teach in peers. Everything's broken down again into these concrete rules and steps of social etiquette. And then each chapter also includes a chapter summary that's meant to be read by the teen or the young adult. And that's just a summary that's kind of written in more kid-friendly language. Now, accompanying that book, there's a DVD that has a number of role play video demonstrations of these targeted skills. And again, they're good and bad examples of social skills. And I, we have that DVD companion really um, because it's, it's one thing to, to read about social skills. It's a whole other thing to kind of see what it looks like or what it shouldn't look like. And then finally, each chapter also includes chapter exercises because it's not just enough to read about the social skills. You have to practice them as well. And that's sort of where the parents come in to provide additional social coaching. So that would be a nice replacement for families that can't access a peers program in their community. Okay, great. Well, thanks for sharing that. So the Science of Making Friends book, along with the, the DVD companion that has some role play demonstrations. And then you also mentioned the app that's available on the iTunes store. Okay. And so where can individuals maybe follow peers on social media or just stay in touch with the latest happenings? Right. So we are on Facebook. Um, so we do post pretty regularly um, on our social media. We also are on Instagram and, and Twitter. Um, and then you can just look us up under UCLA Peers Clinic. Um, and we like to provide um, resources to our families and, and to um, practitioners and educators on our social media. So we post um, almost on a daily basis. And uh, usually the postings are, are things that are going to be relevant to, um, to again, families, to, to self-advocates, um, as well as practitioners. Okay. So do you have any parting piece of guidance or anything that you'd like to share with the community before we wrap up for today? Sure, absolutely. You know, one of the things that we have um, in peers is that friendship is a choice. And we talk about that in relation to the fact that, you know, we don't get to be friends with everybody and not everybody gets to be friends with us. Um, but the other thing we have to consider, too, is that there are certain people that maybe, you know, we know that this, this intervention might be useful for them, but um, maybe they're not willing to participate. You were asking about that very early on um, in this conversation about, you know, who would this program be appropriate for? And one of the first things I mentioned was it's really mostly appropriate for people who are socially motivated, you know, teens and adults who want to learn these skills. And I know that that can be really frustrating for parents who know that their kids could benefit from this intervention. But just like friendship is a choice, we don't get to be friends with everyone and not everyone gets to be friends with us. I mean, friendship is a choice in the, in the sense that it's a choice whether or not you choose to have friends. So for the parents who are listening, who have kids that maybe, you know, aren't willing to, to try some of these skills right now, or maybe say that they don't want to have friends, that they're perfectly fine, you know, being um, with the family or being on their own. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that I know that that is a very frustrating position to be in because you, you want to help your kid. But I think probably the best thing in that situation to do is for parents to get educated about what are the ecologically valid you know, skills related to making and keeping friends so that when they're providing social coaching in the real world, as parents always do, that they're giving good advice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we know that parents and, and adults give advice all the time, but sadly, it doesn't mean that it's always good advice. Um, just because we have good social skills doesn't mean we know how to teach good social skills. Mm -hmm. I think social skills are so automatic to many of us that we don't even think about what we're doing. And so it's very difficult for us to, to kind of break things down into concrete rules and steps. And so just by educating yourself as a parent or as a practitioner and educator about what are the ecologically valid skills, I think we can still provide a lot of support to our kids with autism. That's awesome. Yeah. So definitely by checking out all of the peers resources that are now available, the, the four different manuals, the apps, the videos online and we're going to include all of those different resources in our show notes so there will be tons of value to to pick up 
whether you're a family member or a professional interested in learning more about peers and potentially becoming a certified provider. So thank you, Dr. Lagason. This was so incredible to be able to hear you share more about the upcoming events that are going on in your world with peers and just to share the different programs that you are helping to disseminate around the globe. So thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much, Terry, for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Hey, Quality of Lifers. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Autism Quality of Life podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to the interview with Dr. Liz Logason. For me personally, PEERS is such a wonderful intervention. As a certified PEERS provider, I've really seen PEERS work wonders for teens and have had some really great testimonials from parents about how effective the program was, that they've really been able to make and keep friends more than they ever had. So I recommend checking out their resources over on Dr. Logason's show notes page to learn more about the upcoming trainings if you're a professional and interested in getting certified in peers, and also to check out clinicians near you under the peers certified provider list to see if peers is offered in your area. Okay, thanks again for listening to another episode.